From MTN News, this is Montana This Morning. Details on the Sydney Sugar Plant closure from the people it impacts most. I think it actually impacts almost every facet of our, uh, you know, our economy in Sydney and in Fairview. Plus, more nursing homes are closing in Montana, but help could be on the way. I'm surprised that this one did close because this was our best facility. And free books for local kids were promoting childhood literacy, thanks largely to you, our viewers. Good morning to you all and welcome to Montana This Morning on your Friday, February 10th. Thank you for joining us. First off, a Wyoming man is recovering in a Denver hospital after he was stranded overnight while snowmobiling in the Bighorn Mountains. New this morning, Q2's Diane Parker shows us how search teams pulled off an incredible rescue. See this little black dot? It's right here. This is a person, and it's what many in Wyoming are calling a miracle in the Bighorn Mountains. It is a missing man. He was spotted by helicopter fighting for his life, climbing out of waist deep snow after his snowmobile got stuck. He was pretty out of it. He never waved at the helicopter. They talked to him afterwards. He never heard or knew there was a helicopter, and we were right over him a couple times. Mark Watkins is a contract pilot, but on this Monday mission, he was the spotter running radio, GPS, and satellite phone calls to search and rescue. As crews in the air and on the ground frantically tried to find a missing snowmobiler before the sun went down. It was exhausting. The snow conditions were were very trying and definitely put us our skills to, to the test. We were having anywhere from waist deep to shoulder deep, basically bottomless snow, basically like quicksand. We brought in some professional guides to assist us because of the technicality and they were even having issues. The 57-year-old Sheridan County snowmobiler vanished Sunday. Crews later learned he'd gotten stuck and spent the night in the cold starting a fire to survive. He last made phone contact just after 4 a.m. Monday morning. The train uh, was steep. It was heading into uh, the Box Canyon of the Tongue River area. And after a day of searching with darkness setting in yet again, concerns were rising. But miraculously, just before sunset Monday, Watkins spotted the missing man from high above, a tiny dot in the forest. Within our first ridge line, we went into a valley and sure enough, on the right side, I could see him trying to hike out. He may have been 50 or 100 yards from the top where there was you know, not just trails, but a turnaround for the sleds up there, but it was so steep they couldn't see. The sheriff's office says the man was hypothermic and suffering from frostbite on his hands and feet, but he survived. And while the man hasn't been publicly identified, he's now back home with his family. I did hear that there was no permanent damage. He went to a specialized burn unit down in Denver. I did get a call from the, his wife and she was very appreciative. A life saved thanks to a group of 30 some volunteers who didn't give up. In Wyoming, Diane Parker, MTN News. Thank you for that story, Diane. Wow, really incredible rescue. We're glad he's okay. Absolutely. What a great story there. Yeah, wow, great story. something else. All right, are you ready? I'm ready. Ready for some 50 degree weather? Yeah, I kind of am. Well, Let me go get some vitamin D this weekend. Enjoy while it lasts <laughs> because yeah. I, I want to remind everybody it's still winter time. And Old Man Winter is going to remind Bummer. us next week. Yeah, get ready. But uh, before we get there, it's going to be nice out there. In fact, yesterday turned out to be a really cool day. Uh, it was a bit uh, warmer than average, just a few degrees above the norm. Overnight low, uh, low was milder than normal, too. A bit windy yesterday with gust, uh, gust over 30 miles an hour. Still seeing that this morning. We can still see that all the way through lunchtime here in Billings. Off to our west, it's very windy. More on that in just a second. It's been a dry start to the month. You can see the moisture totals and the snow totals all in the deficit column. Um, and we have may, we don't have a lot of moisture moving forward this week, but we may see some changes as we get into the early part, middle part of next week. 32 right now at the airport. Feels like 19 winds out the southwest at 22. Just had a gust of 33 at the airport. Temperatures across the area, teens, 20s, and 30s with highs today in the 40s and 50s. Now we had gust already near 60 miles an hour down in Livingston. It's eased up just a bit, but still a chance to near lunchtime where we can still see some of those stronger winds, Beartooth, Foothills, Livingston area, up and down 191 near Harlington, but those winds should subside some as we get into the afternoon, but it's still gonna be breezy. Nice weekend on the way with warmer temperatures and then boom, here comes winter. We'll take a look with the main forecast coming up in just a bit. All righty, Miller, lots to talk about. We'll check with him in a few. We've been following the closure of the sugar beet factory in Sydney all week. 300 people will lose their jobs there. We spoke with the owners of Knee Hanky Welding, the family owned business, one of only a few in town older than Sydney Sugars. They tell us their main clientele, farmers, will feel the economic losses as much as anyone. 
farmers. The town's mayor says the sugar company disrespected when announcing the plant's spring closure. Was not impressed at all with the letter that was put out to the employees. Most definitely not. This is not the farmer's fault by any means. The impact of this factory closing in our area just does not affect Sydney. It affects the outlying communities. It's millions of dollars that is possible loss of revenue for the state of Montana and our county. You know, it's just, it's devastating. On top of the loss of a profitable, a profitable crop, it's the, is the specialty sugar beet farm equipment that's all across the valley that no longer has a purpose. Farmers might have invested a lot of money in these that they're not going to get back, making the true economic loss of sugar beets hard to quantify. China is likely responsible for flying spy balloons like the one seen here in Billings over some 40 countries. This information came out during a congressional briefing this week where Montana Senator John Tester played a main role. Q2's David Jay has more. The military gathered items from the balloon, including pieces of cameras and antennas, with officials saying the balloon's route took it past ballistic missile fields and a B-2 stealth bomber base. It didn't fly over us by accident. It was intentional. Do we know what the Chinese Communist government was looking for? Senator, we have some very good guesses about that, uh, and we are learning more as we exploit the contents of the balloon and the payload itself. Montana Senator Steve Dane said he left the meeting with more questions. In a news release, he said it is completely unacceptable and infuriating that the Chinese spy balloon was allowed to hover over Montana and our missile bases and was then allowed to travel across the entire United States before it was brought down. After the hearing, Republican Senator John Kennedy from Louisiana said the photographer in Billings alerted the country. The president has left the impression that if someone in Montana had not spotted the balloon, and called CBS, and CBS didn't print the story, the White House would never to have told us. Desire to keep things classified has to do with not wanting to disclose to the public things that might be inconvenient politically for the department. The Department of Defense says that was not the intent. In Billings, David J. MTN News. David, in the newest branch of the U.S. military, the Space Force, has a small detachment at Malmstrom Air Force Base near Great Falls. This week, base leaders heard from retired Air Force Colonel Bill Wolf. He started a nonprofit to raise awareness about the Space Force near the end of 2019, just a few months before it became a service. Wolf says incidents like the Chinese spy balloon highlight the importance of having military surveillance above the planet. Kind of lends to is the fact that we don't have good surveillance techniques uh, for the air domain. Now let's extend those surveillance capabilities that we have uh, in the air domain and extend that out into the space domain. So if the Chinese are doing that with balloons currently over sovereign airspace, what is happening in the space domain today? And that's a critical aspect of the Space Force and what they're thinking about every single day. Malmstrom is home to Space Operations Squadron Detachment 1 of 22. Officials say the 17-member unit is serving a classified cyber mission. This week at the state capitol, the House Judiciary Committee held a hearing on a bill intended to keep minors from attending drag shows. House Bill 359 would prohibit drag performances that, quote, appeal to a purient interest at public schools and libraries and prevent businesses that host those performances from admitting minors. Supporters say drag shows can't be separated from sexuality, but opponents argue drag can be performed in a way that's appropriate for minors. Drag Story Hour, I think it really speaks to those three values I mentioned, love, community, and acceptance. We really work to show kids what queer joy looks like, and not just queer joy, but what it means to be authentically you. A choice to do that, a private facility so, so, so chooses. I might not agree with that, but it's their choice. But taxpayer-funded facilities should not be um, sponsoring events such as this. So. After the hearing, the committee advanced another bill that would prevent schools from disciplining students for calling another student by their legal name or sex. Supporters say they don't want students to be subjected to discrimination complaints. Those opposing it argue it opens the door to intentional misgendering of transgender students who have a preferred pronoun or name. The community added an amendment that would allow school action if the behavior rose to the level of bullying. More and more Montana nursing homes are closing. Many families now struggling to find care for their loved ones anywhere close to home. Q2's Charlie Kleps finds out why this is happening and what's being done to stop it. 
It's becoming a far too familiar sight in Montana. Nursing homes completely empty and being forced to close their doors. And now the most recent case just happened down the road in Miles City. There were a couple that were really, really upset because all they've ever known is Friendship Villa. Another month brings another nursing home closure to Montana. 12 have now closed in the state over the past year, close to 20% of all nursing homes that exist here. Friendship Villa in Miles City is the latest to shut its doors, a facility that was a staple in the community. I worked there for 34 years. I'm surprised that this one did close because this was our best facility in the northern region. For Kyle Wolf, it meant the end of an era. For the 36 residents who called the facility home, it meant finding a new place to live. We had a great staff. The residents were like number one, man. They were excellent, excellent people. The problem is twofold. Medicaid reimbursement rates set by the state legislature are nowhere high enough to keep many facilities afloat. And nursing home staff statewide is difficult to find. I've never met a caregiver that doesn't love their job. The challenge today is there's not enough of them. So far, all nursing homes in Billings have stayed open, but St. John's CEO David Trous says even the facility isn't immune to the challenges. We are actively reducing our nursing home capacity because of staffing issues. But there are some positive signs. Changes could be coming. I've not seen a, a legislative session that had so much focus to make the reimbursement as right as possible. Governor Gianforte's budget includes $21 million to supplement Medicaid payments for nursing home stays. And Tro says that a proposed bill before the Montana legislature would increase reimbursement rates to help keep these services alive. At the same time, we have all these other needs that are increasing. And so I don't know how this um, legislature is going to manage that. Back at Friendship Villa in Miles City, Wolf is hopeful, hopeful that other rural Montana communities won't suffer the same fate. You know, for us, it's too late. It's too bad, but they really need to. In Billings, Charlie Kleps, MTN News. Thank you, Charlie. A group of aspiring therapists are giving new mothers in Montana a place to turn. Rocky Mountain College students staff Billings Clinic's Cuddling Cubs program. Its mission is to connect new moms in rural areas of Montana with resources and support. So far, the program has already helped 100 women find a safe environment to ask tough questions about parenthood. Are they hungry? Do they need a diaper change? Or you're awake, what do I do with you while you're awake for this time period? I have friends now that are either pregnant or having kids, and a lot of them are living on farms and ranches. It can sometimes be pretty isolating, and that can lead to like anxiety, depression. Having a support system is incredible after kids, and um, not very many people have that, especially in rural areas. Every participant receives a kit filled with helpful, helpful books, toys, and infant massage oils. Q2 was at Pioneer Schools yesterday where all the kids were picking out their six free books. This is part of our partnership with the Scripps Foundation and Scholastic and of course the generous donors in this community. Childhood literacy is critical for all kids to launch into life successfully. I spoke with one seventh grader about what it means to her to learn to love to read. She picked out a historical novel about a girl surviving the Holocaust. Then when I'm at home, I love just being able to sit on the couch or like being in a comfortable spot and I love getting to imagine I can like picture it and I can just sit in an open space and in the silence just I love that. This is the second year if you give a book has been to Pioneer Schools. Thank you to the educators that there for letting us be a part of your important work and if you want to donate to get more free books into the hands of local kids go to ktvq.com slash give a book.